Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Luncheon with the Experts. This is a Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Lexicon Pharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett. I'm a filmmaker that has been working with CCF for almost a decade now to create video content that helps spread awareness and, and education about neuroendocrine cancer. And it's been it's been such a, a valuable special journey for me to be a part of, of this community and create the content that we create and help the people that we help. Um, so thank you first and foremost, uh, off, off the bat for just allowing me to be a part of it and allowing me to help share some of your stories. So lunch with the experts is made possible by lexicon pharmaceuticals. So we always want to thank them for their support. We couldn't do this without them. We do have a brief disclaimer from them. We just want to say the opinions expressed by the guest presenter, as well as the questions asked by the audience at home that you have not been created or suggested in advance by the sponsors of the, of the uh, Facebook Live Lunch with the Experts. And CCF doesn't endorse nor promote any of the views, opinions, or information expressed in the presentation. So audience members, again, that is you at home, should not rely solely on the, on the opinions or information presented today and should seek guidance and direction for their own medical advice, uh, from their own medical advisors, rather, regarding any choices they make about their health and treatment. So all that is saying is we're going to give you some advice today that hopefully helps you along this journey, but by all means, speak to your own medical team and devise your own plan because they are going to understand your specific case like uh, our guest today and certainly myself won't be able to. So our guest today is Dr. Jonathan Strasberg coming in from Tampa, correct? Uh, correct? Yep. Yes, I've actually, uh, he is at home. I've been to his home. He was grateful enough to allow me there. This was pre-COVID time, so I'm not sure if we would do it now. How is life? How are you, how are you doing, doctor? Uh, good, thanks. Uh, you know, working more from home on administered days, we're doing more telehealth visits, um, but still mostly in person. And, and so far, things at Moffitt at least are going okay. Um, we haven't been overwhelmed with COVID cases. So, so for those, uh, you know, you mentioned Moffitt, Moffitt Cancer Center. For those who are unaware of, uh, of you and what you do in, in the community, could you give us a little, a little background in, into you know, where you work and, and what field that you specialize in? Uh, sure. I'm a professor at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa. Um, I work in the GI oncology department. I'm an oncologist. Um, I see uh, exclusively neuroendocrine tumors. And so, and how long have you been working in that in that space? About 15 years. 15 years. So I see gastrointopancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and lung neuroendocrine tumors, well differentiated ones at least. Uh, I don't see uh, medullary thyroid cancers, few chromosomes, things like that. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so um, everybody that's joining us, I see that we are starting to starting to comment and uh, see some of our our top fans joining us. And a lot of you already know the the drill, which is to let us know where you are in the world. Let us know where you're signing on from. We love to uh, we love to see our reach. And lunch with the experts. I was just talking with Dr. Strasberg before we started recording, and and this is like a deeper dive into the members of our community. We, last year, we did a Facebook Live program where each month uh, we had on a different guest and talked about a specific topic, and Dr. Strasberg was on, uh, was on that, that show as well. This, we're not going to be so topic-based. We're going to allow you to ask any questions that you have about your journey, about what makes the guest uh, you know, do what they do, what, you know, what they've seen in their experience. So go ahead and start sending your questions in, and we'll try to get to them through my conversation today with Dr. Strasberg with respect to his time. Uh, and everyone's, we may not be able to get to all of your questions. And if we do not or cannot, I urge you to reach out to the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, either here on their Facebook page or at carcinoid.org, www.carcinoid.org. You can send them a message there. And before we get started, I just want to say that we know it's challenging to be a net patient or a person seeking diagnosis, especially in the pandemic and the situation that we are in. So CCF is here and remains here for you whenever you need us, however you need us. And one of the best ways that we, we serve you all is through valuable content that we try to create like this. And so if you would like to help us and show your support in return and help us continue to create these programs, an easy way to do that is just to text the word experts to one nine one four 
1-914-380-7323. That's 1-914-380-7323. And you can text the word experts and give a little donation, small or large or medium size, any size. It really helps us continue to make these, uh, make these programs possible. So if you see some value uh, in what we're doing, you want to help us continue to do it, that would be outstanding. Um, so we talked a little bit, Dr. Strasberg, about how things have, have changed for you in, in, in the work that you do. Um, I think a lot of people, one of the things I've noticed about this, this situation that we're all in is it's a struggle for all of us, no matter what, what we do uh, and whatever job that we do. I think for people in the healthcare industry, clearly it's, it's, it's more of a challenge. Are there certain things though that you're doing hurt in your personal life to, to, to maintain your mental health to like, to, 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 you know what I mean? Like, cause this is super challenging. It's depressing. It's anxiety driving for those that, that do have a diagnosis of a, of a disease. It's got to be stressful, but, but personally, is there, is there any changes that you've made to how you go about your day to day that have helped you navigate this? We're like six months, you know, into this now, or at least five months into this. How do you, how do you manage? Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to complain as much as, uh, you know, I mean, there, there are people who have lost their jobs. There are whole industries right. that are, are really hurt. Um, you know, absolutely. I, I, my inconveniences are nothing compared to that. So I don't want to, but there's still, in, there's still challenges and struggles regardless, you know, and you're right. And I say, I, I totally agree, but it's a spectrum. Like even those that are fortunate, I 100% consider mine, I consider myself one of those, it's, it's challenging. Those that have kids at home, I know you have kids at home. Um, yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we, it, it, was, it was getting old after a few months <laughs> of uh, the kids around 24 um, seven, especially, uh, you know, trying to balance um, working from home and trying to entertain them at the same time. That, was, uh, that wasn't easy. Um, they're in club now, so it's a little bit better. What's uh, club? It's uh, like a, uh, you know, uh, a school after sort of an after school okay. program, except it's all day. So they get to swim a little bit, hopefully do some educational stuff. Oh, that's cool. Um, things like that. So and are they, are they just occupied from like nine to three? Are they just doing virtual school now? They're supposed to start virtual school a uh, week after next. So mm -hmm. we'll see how that works. But right. they're, they're going to do it also from from the clubhouse, hopefully, so that they're not actually at home. I think everything is such a uh, trial these days, right? I mean, you, you, you know, <laughs> you, you try out what you think may work and we all have to be kind of prepared to, to pivot. Um, I was curious, I know you've, you've worked in this, this field for a while. Was there, a th was there something that, like what drove you to this field? I mean, you, you know, yeah. Um, well, um, during my training, uh, my mentor was one of the leading net specialists in the United States, maybe, you know, globally, and Larry Coles. Uh, and he sort of inspired me to um, move into the field, both, you know, because... Um, because of the work he was doing? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such an interesting field. Right. Uh, and there was so much room for, for progress with, with so few available treatments. Um, so you know, that, that's, that was my inspiration to, to get into the neuroendocrine tumor area. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Like you, you could really make an impact on the work that, that you're doing instead of just kind of trickling along existing systems. Like you can really make, make a difference with the, with the right, uh, you know, the right, the right research, the right findings, the right treatments. Um, and to that point, how do you feel now looking back at it at, you know, the treatment options that, that we have now, how we're able to approach, diagnose this disease. What are the differences you see now versus when, when you started and you saw those gaps that you, that you uh, wanted to help fill? Uh, big differences. I mean, uh, you know, 15 years ago, all we had pretty much were somatostatin analogs, uh, octrea scans in addition to conventional imaging and, um, Liver directed therapy. That was that was the only standard approach. And since then, there have been a lot of new drugs. There have been new diagnostic tests, like the Gallon 68 Dota Take PET. Um, so it's you know it's 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 been a big change. We've gone from about one approved treatment to maybe seven or so. Got it. Got it. Now, I know that you're also deeply involved besides just the work that you do day to day. 
I know you're, are, are you still a board member of Nanats? Yep. And, uh, and also you're involved in NCCN, is that correct? Yes. What are, what are some of the other ways that you try to pursue, you know, sp- spreading awareness and, re- you know, education about this disease other than, ju- you know, the people that, that you see in your day-to-day work? Well, my, my entire academic effort is, surrounds NET. So lots of clinical trials in which I've played, you know, major roles. Um, the, the National Cancer Institute, NET Task Force, the cooperative group, um, uh, NET um, committees. I mean, it's, uh, it's many different organizations that are involved with neuroendocrine tumor research, uh, promotion of information, awareness, things like that. I had a quick question. We're starting to get questions in from the audience and our and our numbers are, are growing fast. So that's exciting. But something that I've been interested in, and we've actually, uh, besides doing lunch with the experts, we create uh, longer form videos. Well, not as long as, as, as these an hour, but, but topic based treatment videos that we've been creating in this, uh, this video series for Carson and Cancer Foundation. And uh, we're updating videos that I initially did for them 10 years ago. And, and Dr. Strasberg has been featured in some of those specifically on uh, PRT and other, and other topics, but we have one on, on net guidelines that's coming out soon. So this is something I've been like hands on with a lot late, a lot lately. And, and with you working with, um, you know, NCCN, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about why the importance of guidelines, how do guidelines help you all do your job better? Well, um, the guidelines are probably not as much for the people who are creating the guidelines, but for the people who may be a little bit less familiar with the disease. Um, although with respect to the NCCN specifically, um, it has a major impact on um, Medicare and insurance company reimbursement. So mm. the NCCN is, is, you know, particularly in the United States, but even globally is a major driver of um, of you know governmental funding and insurance insurance funding so if i'm understanding correctly basically it helps explain what's actually going on to insurance companies who aren't familiar with the disease no it's more than that i mean there's an nccn compendium of drugs so drugs that are um and and scans uh things that are endorsed by the nccn uh are generally a template for medicare medicaid insurance companies to consider standard of care Got so the NCCN is not just a guideline for clinicians. Understood. So, yeah. And the, yeah. you know, there, there's other guidelines, NANETS, in fact, um, mm-hmm. you know, has been. Those are the two main ones, right? NCCN and NANETS? Is that... In the United States, you know, there's okay. the NANETS guidelines um, NANETS. in Europe. There's uh, Commonwealth guidelines for the, you know, Australia, New Zealand. There, there's various other, other guidelines. Got it. Got it. And are they serving different purposes? I know they might serve different communities, but how much, you know, how similar are they or what is the, the things that divide that separate them? Um, well, you know, they're, they're obviously somewhat similar, but uh, they represent uh, different perspectives of mm-hmm. different clinicians. You know, neuroendocrine tumors are, are extremely diverse. Uh, people have all sorts of different perspectives. Even though we have more evidence, there's there's not much evidence to tell us, for example, how to sequence treatments. Um, so you can have different groups coming up with guidelines that are far from identical. Um, and um, overall, it helps paint the a clearer, bigger picture. It seems right. Um, right? <clears throat> correct. I mean, uh, people can choose which which guidelines they they prefer to follow, and of course. The guidelines are, are in many cases not completely pres- prescriptive. They, they provide people with options. It's not like a pathway that says you need to start with A, and you need to then move on to B, and then on to C, which I think would be a little bit of a fool's errand for neuroendocrine tumors. They're just too diverse. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that may work for, say, colorectal cancer or, or breast cancer, um, but uh, even those cancers are becoming too complicated in many cases to be able to provide a simple algorithm. But neuroendocrine tumors, for sure, it's impossible to give a sort of a pathway approach. 
Right, right. Um, well, I want to go ahead and, and pivot into some of the questions that are coming in uh, from the audience. We've got great numbers today. So thanks, everybody, if you're just joining us. This is Luncheon with the Experts with our guest, Dr. Jonathan Strasberg. Uh, he's been gracious enough with his time, and I want to be respectful of yours as well. So let's go ahead and get to some questions. And speaking of what we just said with how, uh, how different the journeys can be for neuroendocrine cancer, um, we have a comment or a question from Jillian who says, I'm very new to this. Can some NETs or, or carcinoid tumors uh, be non-cancerous? I've been told mine were, but I don't understand from other readings. So, so she, she's getting some, some uh, opposing information, basically. Is that right? Makes, yeah. yeah. So nets are a little bit unique in that if they're well differentiated and low grade, and you're looking at a tumor that is not yet metastasized, a pathologist can't necessarily look under the microscope and say your tumor is benign or your tumor is malignant. Um, sometimes what the clinician can say after reviewing the pathology is, you know, this is a high likelihood of of behaving in a malignant fashion or uh, a low likelihood, sometimes very low likelihood. For example, if you have a appendiceal neuroendocrine tumor that man measures five millimeters, you can say the risk of you know malignant behavior is so low that it's never been described in the literature. Even though you can say you know that metaphysically impossible for that cancer to spread. So it ranges from essentially zero to to high, depending on a lot of different factors. Of course, once it's metastasized, then it's clearly malignant. Got it. Got if it. it's Hopefully. high grade, then it's clearly malignant. If it has a lot of dividing cells or other features of a high grade cancer. Okay, so hopefully that helps, Jillian. And I'll also reiterate that if um, if we give you some information and and help, but you need, or, you know, often it creates a new question, right? And so if you need further information, if we're not able to get to a follow up question you might have today, again reach out to Carcinoid Cancer Foundation either here in a direct message on their Facebook page or at carcinoid.org and they will work tirelessly to, to help get you to the right information or the right specialist that can do that. Uh, Dr. Strasberg, we have um, a couple of hellos and shout outs. Uh, Mary Kay Collins says hello and then uh, and someone else says best doctor ever with multiple right. exclamation points. So the love is being spread, You're my friend. You're suppressing the negative comments. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I know how to do my job. <laughs> Why is Dr. Strasberg on there? Just kidding. They love you. They actually, and I've seen these comments, uh, you know, we promote the show uh, on Monday. We let people know who's coming up for the upcoming week. So a lot of people have been saying super positive things, Thank you. but we already knew that about you. Um, interesting question from Hope. Hope says, have you ever heard of carcinoid rage? I haven't heard of this. Is this a real thing? I've heard it described, uh, not so much in the literature, but probably within um, anecdotal. And anec well, anecdotal and within sort of the maybe in the in the internet communities. I'm, mm. you know, I mean, you know, carcinoid and neuro, you know, other neuroendocrine tumors produce hormones. Some of these cause, you know, very well-defined syndromes. For sure. Uh, whether there's such a thing truly as carcinoid rage is is very hard to say. I mean, I'm yeah. skeptical myself. Right. I mean, you know, to call it something like that would be, would be hard to, to determine, but can it affect your mood? I'm, uh, I'm sure. Well, yeah. I mean, having cancer obviously can affect your mood. Um, whether hormones produced by carcinoid tumors have a particular effect on mood is in some patients is, you know, or a particular manifestation of a, of that mood is, is hard to say. It's not well described. Right. I mean, I think that, that, that it would be extremely hard to determine whether that's a carcinoid or neuroendocrine uh, cancer thing versus just the having cancer thing. You yep. know, I mean, that's a challenge for anybody. So I'm sure it, affect, it if, uh, affects your mood. <clears throat> okay. So we have a top fan, Anna. What's up, Anna? Welcome back. I'm having serious weight gain and I have severe diarrhea and I've had my ileum remo uh, removed colon resection. Four lymph nodes, size of softball is metastasized in my liver uh, all throughout this. I am gaining weight with all of this. Is that is that something that's that's normal from your experience? And if so, is there any way to combat that? So it, it sounds like it's a metastatic small bowel carcinoid tumor, potentially with carcinoid syndrome. So diarrhea was mentioned, and of course, diarrhea is one of the main features of carcinoid syndrome. I hope mm -hmm. that it's being treated, for example, with at least with the somatostatin analog. Um, 
you know, the, the cause of the diarrhea though can be multifactorial, including the surgery that's done, uh, that was done to remove the primary tumor. So there are drugs like cholestyramine, for example, that can, uh, that can help with that. Uh, as for weight gain, you know, cancer itself should not cause weight gain, nor do the treatments uh, generally cause weight gain. So the question is, are this, is this caloric weight gain or is this fluid weight gain? Hmm. Um, you know, if it's fluid weight gain, that's concerning. Um, you know, and I don't want to jump in, you know, into wild speculations, but right. there are patients who develop carcinoid heart disease that can develop, you know, turn into congestive heart failure, which leads to, to fluid weight gain, for example, or, you know, liver full of tumors that, uh, that can cause, you know, accumulation of fluid also in the abdomen and in the legs, which leads to weight gain. So I, I don't want to imply by any means that this is what's going on with, with Anna, did you say? Yes. The, but uh, um, you know, this is this is just just speculation. Obviously, I need more detail. Yeah, absolutely. So, Anna, I hope that, that helps a little bit. And I will say that to Anna and anyone else out there watching, if you scrub through the videos that we have, you can just go to the videos tab uh, on the Facebook page. You can also go to their uh, Carson and Cancer Foundation's YouTube channel. We've touched base on a lot of these topics. So, as Dr. Stras Strasberg mentioned, carcinoid heart disease. We've had a we've had a Facebook Live program on that featuring Dr. Jerry Zox. So uh, more times than not, depending on the topic that, that you're concerned with, we, we have a video and some information out there. The about fluid weight gain would be pretty obvious. For example, uh, you know, you'd see swelling in your legs, what's called pitting edema, where you press down and the, the, the skin remains uh -huh. depressed. So um, that, would be, that would be a concern for fluid weight gain um, as opposed to just normal putting on weight. Right, right, right. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Anna. I hope that helps. Um, let's see. Okay. So we have a question from Margaret. It says, my question is, I have a mid-gut primary tumor that has metastasized. Do the tumors that have metastasized also spread? Yeah. I mean, um, it's, I get, you get asked that question sometimes. Um, so it's for sure what's not the situation is that the primary keeps shooting out metastases. And if you remove the primary, then you no longer develop new metastases. That's clearly not the case, but right. it's better to think about it as, you know, there's, there's cancer cells in the system, which have the propensity to grow and spread. Um, whether each individual metastasis can also spread, the answer is probably yes. Um, you know, by shedding tumors into the bloodstream. Um, but um, you know the, that's the, the way to think about it is not the net, that it's just a primary tumor that spreads. Got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, we have another top fan, Wendy, that says, uh, and we'll talk. You know, I know you and I have talked a lot about PRRT. So she, Wendy says, if you are not peptide receptor positive, what treatment options do you have? Um, PNET with METs uh, metastases to liver already had Whipple and liver resection. So can we establish, first of all, what, what she means by peptide receptor positive? She means uh, somatostatin receptor negative. In other words, the tumors are not lighting up on the Gallium-68 dota okay. uh, or Octria scan. Um, so the answer is, um, you know, the PRT, of course, is out of the question. The somatostatin analogs almost certainly not helpful either, if that's really the case. And that leaves uh, Afinitor, Sutent, and then chemotherapy, uh, for example, capecitabine, temozolomide. So those would be the three systemic treatments available that are not dependent on somatostatin receptor expression. And we tend to use the chemotherapy in tumors that are a little bit more on the aggressive side, which somatostatin receptor negative tumors sometimes are. Got it, got it. All right, thank you for that. Hopefully that helps. Uh, speaking of um, Amy or Ami, says, do nets always show up on gallium scans? Are there instances where, where they don't? Correct. So, of course, not always. Uh, the gallium scans, as I just mentioned, rely on some metastatin receptor expression. Mm -hmm. And if they don't express some metastatin receptors or express relatively few, you won't see them on the dotatate scan, on the gallium 68 dotatate scans. So what would be the alternative for them then? Well, you still have the regular scans, the CT, the MRI. Sometimes we use regular PET scan. The regular type of PET scan would be an FDG PET scan. Mm -hmm. uh, so just conventional imaging modalities. Got it. If got there's it. something to image, of course. 
Okay, from Vicky. Vicky says, if diagnosis is made from abdominal lymph node cells as mid-gut, but primary has not been located, what type of scans, tests, and labs would you order to try to locate the primary? So presumably the patient has uh, mesenteric uh, uh, lymph nodes uh, that uh, in the vast majority of cases point to a primary tumor in the mid-gut or the small intestine. Um, usually the gallium 68 PET will pick up the primary tumor. Um, if not, you know, there are other <clears throat> scans such as, for example, CT and that are designed to look at the small intestine. But if a gallium 68 PET hasn't been done, that would be the, uh, the first step. And, and, you know, almost all mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors express somatostatin receptors. Now, you know, if, if this is a potential surgical situation, and it really looks like it's a mid-gut, and, and even if the gallium 68 doesn't show the primary tumor, if, if the surgeon goes in and does surgery, they can do what's called running the small intestine, which is basically inspecting the small intestine, palpating the small intestine. Usually that reveals the um, tumor in the small intestine. Okay, got it. Thank you. Hopefully that helps. Um, if you're just joining us today, we are almost halfway through. So go ahead and send your questions in. And I see a few of you sending the little uh, thumbs up emoji and the heart emojis. We love to see that if we're doing a good job, if Dr. Strasberg is giving some value and letting and, and helping you along this journey, that's an easy visual way for you to, to tell us that we're, we're doing a good job and we'll keep that up. Uh, please let us know where you are in the world. And also, I want to say that this video, it's a lot of information coming at you very quickly. Uh, there may be people out there in your network, in your circle, patients, caregivers that would benefit from this. If they're unable to make uh, this live broadcast, it will live here. This video will live here evergreen on the videos tab on the Facebook page. And then also starting Monday, we will have this available on the YouTube channel for those that don't have Facebook because plenty of people don't have Facebook. So it will be available for them as well the thumbs up and the heart emojis are pouring in. So it looks like we're doing a good job. Look, right. Dr. Strasberg was worried about that. He's, <laughs> he's feeling good now. So Danette says, how likely are mesentery nets to cause problems after ilium primary was removed along with small nets in the pelvis? She also indicates stage four non-functional. Do I need injections and PRRT? That's hard to. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So the question is why the mesenteric tumors were not removed. And, and, and probably the answer is that they weren't resectable, which is often the case if there's blood vessel involvement. Um, so can they cause problems? Yes. And as you know, um, and it's not clear to me where the other metastases are. Um, and yes, it sounds like uh, she should be on some anastatin analog injections, either sanostatin or somatulene, if she has unresectable disease. Uh, PRT is usually a you know a second step if there's progression on a somatostatin analog. Got it, got it. I've got a uh, <laughs> I've got a question from Lynn who is very adamant. Please, but I should point out with the with the previous question. I mean, there are <laughs> rare cases where the volume of disease is so low that that we'll just observe, and perhaps that might be a reason why she's not on a somatostatin analog yet. Although you know that's that's more of an exception than the rule. In, in your experience, is there any sort of common denominator among, you know, net patients? I know nets are, are all, there's all kinds of different neuroendocrine tumors and, you know, we still have a lot to learn, but Lynn asked a question like, you know, and, and we may not have a direct answer to this, but is there any common denominator that you've seen in your years of, of studying and research and trials? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, it's a broad question. <laughs> um, uh, so I don't know. I mean, one question that I often hear is, is it genetic? Um, so I don't know if this is exactly what Lynn is asking. And Lynn, if you're still out there, you can please clarify. Um, you know, obviously cancer People ask about why nets happen in the first place. Um, yeah. And, you know, most for most nets that are not hereditary, there's there's no clear... Um, etiology, in other words, there's no clear environmental um, etiology like smoking for lung cancer or, right. or alcohol for certain types of liver cancer. Um, you know, uh, cancers are thought in, in 
all cases or in almost all cases to arise from mutations in cells and and that's almost certainly what's happening with nets and then in many nets uh we know which mutations uh are the are the primary drivers um you can do you know you can do a genetic analysis of the tumor um but some nets are are you know the the mutations have not been clearly identified so midgut nets for example have much fewer mutations on average than almost any other cancer, um, which makes it hard to know which mutations particularly led to their development. Um, and it could be that it's more epigenetic changes involving um, the expression of genes rather than mutations within the genes themselves. Mm -hmm. But, you know, m many cancers start with random mutations and don't have a clear, clear cause. Right. Understood. All right. Thank you, Dr. Strasberg. Looks like we are indeed helping some people. Thank you for giving your time to us. Jillian says, thanks so much for answering. That did help. Awesome, Jillian. It's great to hear. <laughs> Christina says, carcinoid rage. Yes, it is real. All right. <laughs> um, okay. So, Anne, you are welcome for these live shows. I'm glad to hear it's helping you. Uh, Anne has a uh, net in small intestine, metastasized to the liver. Uh, but after three surgeries, uh, she is NED, no evidence of disease. Is there any benefit to Anne taking sandostatin or any other medication for prevention or any other purpose at this point, in your opinion? Right. That's a good question. It's a little bit uh, controversial um, okay. uh, because there's, it's very likely that somatostatin analogs can delay recurrence. Um, whether starting them this early will improve survival in the long run is is very difficult to say. Uh, usually if a patient has had so-called debulking surgery that left them without any evidence of disease, we usually don't start a somatostatin analog. We wait until there is evidence of disease uh, and spare the patient, you know, months of in, or years of injections uh, because there's no evidence that early treatment improves survival. But I would say in someone who's already had three debulking surgeries, it might be worth just starting the the treatments and and maybe delaying time to the fourth surgery. Um, that would be, I think, uh, uh, probably a worthy goal of it, in of itself. And how long how long do you think, uh, if there is no evidence of disease, would you continue to to monitor whether it be in scans or or whatever? Well, for for the vast majority of of liver surgeries, uh, the outcome is not cure. In fact, the, the percentage of cases with liver surgery that are cured is, is almost negligible. Um, so these person, people require lifetime surveillance. Okay. Frequency if there's no evidence of disease? Well, it depends on how aggressive the cancer looked to start, to the start. Okay. Some case, you know, I mean, on average, if it's not too aggressive, six to 12 months, I mean, there are patients, um, with uh, relatively unaggressive tumors, even if they've metastasized, they've had surgery, uh, we'll see them as rarely as, as once a year. Um, it, re it depends how many years have elapsed in surgery, um, how aggressive it was, mm -hmm. things like that. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Strasberg, and thank you, Anne, for your question. I hope that helps. We're seeing more people talk about uh, uh, most patients have heard of carcinoid rage. We learned to manage it. So this is a good example. I just want to take a moment to say, uh, and I've said this before on the show, I love how there's a side community going on in the comments. To me, that illustrates the the power, and, you know, and the beautiful nature of the neuroendocrine cancer community. Right? Um, we're going to try to help you. I'm certainly not the expert, but we have experts on. Um, but also, your experience in sharing these stories with other patients is such a valuable way to help each other. So I encourage that. If if someone asks a question. Uh, and you have something that may help them, this is a great opportunity for us to, to continue to help each other. The more people know about this disease, the more, uh, the, more uh, the better you know, we can be get at diagnosing it, developing treatments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about new treatments uh, coming down. Sue has a question. Are there any new treatments on the horizon for grade three well-differentiated and grade three poorly differentiated tumors that do not express som somatostatin? Um, What's next if immuno and full fox? I'm not sure what full fox is. Don't work. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. What can we explain what that is? Um, I mean, full fox is a chemotherapy regimen consisting of five fluorouracil and oxaliplatin. It's it's 
used in aggressive neuroendocrine tumors as well okay. as many gastrointestinal cancers in general. Okay, got it. Um, so, you know, so let's start with poorly differentiated neuroendocrine cancers, which are biologically and, and clinically completely different from well differentiated tumors. Um, they're always aggressive. Uh, the standard of care has been uh, carboplatin etoposide or other platinum based regimens uh, for many years. Um, whether Fulfox was the first regimen here or second after platinum etoposide, I, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, Fulfox could be potentially a first line regimen too. Um, but beyond that, there really hasn't been anything that's been shown to, uh, to work. Uh, recently, there's been some preliminary evidence showing that combination immunotherapy with ipilimumab and ivolumab has some activity. Um, but the studies have been very small, not to um, not not up to the standards that would give that would give us a great answer about how many patients, what percentage of patients will respond. I mean, overall, it's not it's it's certainly less than fifty percent, probably less than twenty five percent. Um, beyond that, there's really hasn't been much. There was, however, a drug approved. Um, a few weeks ago for small cell lung cancer, uh, lurbanectidin. Um, mm. And of course, small cell lung cancer has some resemblance to poorly differentiated neuroendocrine cancers, including small cell neuroendocrine cancers of the gastrointestinal tract and other places. So, you know, there's potential for that drug in this situation, but it hasn't been studied yet. And what was the name of that drug again? Lurbanectidin. Okay. We'll try to, uh, everybody... Zepzelka is, is easy to... Uh, Spell Z E. That's just that's the brand name. Okay. Z E P Z E L C A. Okay. Well, uh, everybody at home, what we try to do when uh, a guest mentions something like this, or resource, or something like that, is we'll try to include that in the comments. So keep your eyes out for that. We've got a team on the on the. Back but anyway, end. I don't want to necessarily say that that does this you know imply that this new drug has a huge amount of potential for poorly differentiated neuroendocrine cancers because of course small cell lung cancer is its own unique disease that's you know uh, almost 100% associated with smoking it's biologically not identical to say small cell esophageal cancer or or rectal or or bladder things like that um as far as well differentiated grade 3 those are more similar to the low and intermediate grade neuroendocrine tumors um although more aggressive um and um, there have been very few uh, studies focusing on this particular population. It's, it's been a little bit neglected to some extent because it wasn't really a well-defined category um, until recently. It was sort of a gray area. Um, but um, in general, there's, there's a lot of emerging treatments for well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, not, not necessarily grade three, but just well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors in general. So, you know, there's a drug called uh, surafatinib that was shown to be effective, similar to sunitinib, sutent. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, but it was, it was shown to be uh, effective in a Chinese study, both in pancreatic nets and non-pancreatic nets. Uh, there are, there's a drug called exitinib that's very similar. It blocks the vascular endothelial growth factor receptor. Uh, we did a trial with that years ago, but there's a a large phase three study from Spain that is going to be presenting data at the European um, Medical Oncology Society this fall. So we'll see if that shows, is that the positive study? It was in non-pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and there's a bunch of other similar drugs that are, that are in treatment. So all these drugs have the potential to um, uh, inhibit tumor growth. They don't shrink tumors as much, but they, they can inhibit tumor progression to some extent. Got it. Got it. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for your question. I have a see Terry ask, can we ask a question to this? Yes, absolutely. You can Terry. And if everybody's just joining us or you joined us late, we've got about 20 minutes left with Dr. Strasberg. So go ahead and send those questions in. Bernard says, hello from Kenya. What's up Bernard? That's a great reach. Love to see it. Um, you know, we talked earlier about heart carcinogenic heart disease and I saw a question from an audience member just a second ago. And, and I know other people are concerned with this. What is there a percentage of of net patients that will develop carcinoid heart disease? 
these percentage uh, questions are always difficult because it really sure. depends on what the denominator is. I mean, if you're talking about all net patients, that's you wouldn't think of all net patients. You think of right. patients with carcinoid syndrome. Um, but it's, it, it, it correlates with the severity of the carcinoid syndrome and particularly with the levels of the urine 5-HIAA, uh, which is a metabolite of serotonin. So once it goes, the urine 5-HIAA goes above, say, five times upper limit normal, uh, that's when you really start thinking about a more than trivial risk of carcinoid heart disease. Um, and, you know, over a lifetime, if it's, if it's above that threshold, you know, it's, it's probably... 20 to 30 or percent of patients will develop it. Okay, got it. But overall, it's a small minority of net patients. Okay, so unless you're experiencing carcinoid syndrome, you think it's safe to, to not stress about well, that? Too uh, much, for mid gut carcinoids, it's important, I think, to check urinary 5 HIA or plasma 5 HIA in those institutions that do that. Um, serotonin is less accurate, but you can check that as well. Um, and, uh, and, uh, even if patients aren't experiencing much flushing or diarrhea, if those levels are very high, uh, you want to screen for carcinoid heart disease. And the, the most common way of doing that is with an echocardiogram. Got it. Um, I just saw a question from another top fan, uh, Pat. Hey, Pat, good to see you as always. She had a question about the gallium uh, scan. If What's the smallest uh, tumor that will register? Is it, is it, you know, we talked about that brief, uh, previously. Is it one millimeter, five millimeters? Probably around five millimeters. Five millimeters. Okay. Great. Bernard from Kenya says, what's the best, uh, what's the, what are the best investigation to be done? What is the best investigation to be done in resource limited settings for suspected nets and follow-up? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, yeah. It really depends on what the reason for suspicion is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, a urine 5-HIA, well, I mean, it's, it's hard to answer that because it depends on what symptoms you're starting out with. Got it. Bernard, if you want to send some more information, we love that you're tuning in from Kenya. So we want to help. Uh, if you want to send some more information that might help clarify that, and Dr. Strasberg will try to get back to the question. From Richard, are scans without contrast dye effective on tracing since I have kidney issues? Um. Obviously, uh, scans without intravenous contrast are not as good as scans that include intravenous contrast. Um, you know, it, it, it varies. I mean, sometimes they're okay, um, especially if you already know that you can see the tumors on the non-contrast images. Uh, sometimes they're completely useless. Uh, MRI without contrast is usually um, more useful than a CT scan without intravenous contrast. And then the Gallium 68 PET, as well as other PET scans, have no impact on the kidney whatsoever. So Got you it. Can use contrast with those. Terry asks, uh, you know, you've talked when we briefly started about uh, telehealth. And so Terry asks, can documentation be forwarded to you uh, to review her husband's case, and can the appointment uh, be done over FaceTime or Zoom? Is that so something that you're doing? For a new or? patient telehealth appointment, what we would basically do is uh, schedule it like any other new patient appointment. We would obtain the records um, and uh, just have a regular visit, except it's conducted over Zoom. And obviously, there's no physical exam. Got it. All right, everybody, we are still churning along. We've got a great numbers today. Dr. Strasberg, you must be uh, highly sought after. I don't think it's, I don't think it's me, my friend. I don't think it's me. They're, they're used to seeing me. Um, from Brenda, we're going to keep churning along with questions because we've got a lot of them. We want to try to help you all at home. From, from Brenda, what makes you consider a tumor inoperable? She put in parentheses, not in pancreas, but uh, is there, you know, when, at what point would a tumor be inoperable? That can mean many things, uh, whether you're talking about a tumor or the, metastatic disease in general. But if it's an individual tumor, that's something that the surgeon evaluates. And inoperable generally means that's invading an important structure that can't be removed. Usually, often that means a blood vessel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are, uh, so it's hard to know what that question is referring to, because also we operate on patients with metastatic disease, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, different surgeons can have different opinions on what is reasonable to go after uh, surgically? What's um, 
What's something that's that's happened? I know you talked about some of the new drugs, but are there are there other treatments or things that that you know about that are coming down the pipeline that that you think will help you know help us navigate this disease better? Well, one sort of early phase um, drug that I'm particularly enthusiastic about is a type of PRT. Um, actually, well, there's a category of PRT called alpha emitters. Uh, I think it's often referred to as targeted alpha therapy. Right. Yes, uh, I've heard about this. A completely this. different type of radiation from uh, lutathera, lutetium, or yttrium that's been the traditional uh, beta-emitting isotopes. Mm-hmm. Um, Ibrahim Del Passan at Excel Diagnostics recently presented some data from a phase one study using lead dotamtate, and lead is a, lead two twelve is also an alpha emitter, uh, and the the pictures were truly extraordinary. Um, so you know it's hard to uh, you know to the extent that you can um, draw conclusions from a small number of patients, it's looking very exciting. So they're still uh, doing expansion. It's for patients with uh, somatostatin receptor positive uh, neuroendocrine tumors. I think at this point they're they're looking at patients who are PRT naive as well as patients who have already received lutathera. Um, but um, yeah, it's available at uh, Excel Diagnostics, obviously for patients with progressive tumors. Got it. Um, we mentioned, you know, we've talked a little bit about scans today. Margaret has a question. What's the difference between the gallium uh, or the PET scan and the FDG PET scan? So gallium PET scan looks for presence of somatostatin receptors. So it uh, looks at somatostatin receptor expressing tumors. FDG PET is the, I would call it the conventional PET scan. It, it looks at uptake of glucose um, and relies on the fact that cancers metabolize glucose. Um, more than normal tissue. Now, well, the low-grade neuroendocrine tumors will often be FDG PET negative because they're not aggressive and therefore not metabolically active. So the FDG PET is, is particularly useful for poorly differentiated or otherwise aggressive neuroendocrine cancers. Got it. Thank you so much. Everybody out there, just less than 15 minutes. If you're getting some value today, send us a thumbs up or the heart emoji down there. Let us know that, uh, that we are doing a good job. Dr. Strasberg and, and I both love to, to, to get that positive reinforcement. Um, we've had, you, you know, Lisa, Lisa, you're saying, can, you know, can I rewind the video I only caught the end about carcinoid rage? It's a lot of opinions on, uh, on carcinoid and rage, doctor. And, and I, I haven't I mentioned them all. I didn't, I just wanted to he did not. I, I, I want to support him here. Uh, but, um, but Lisa, yes. So when you, you probably, you can't rewind the video now that it's broadcasting live, but as soon as we're done, done, it's going to post as a video on the Carson Cancer Foundation page, right where you are. And, uh, and you can certainly go back and rewind it. And I would also encourage you to just scrub through the comments because uh, like I just said, there's a lot of uh, people sharing their thoughts on carcinoid rage specifically. Um, hopefully they're, they're not raging at us too, uh, too much. Um, I, I, Dr. Strasberg, I don't know of, um, your experience with lung nets, uh, but we're just getting a ton of, of comments, people talking to each other too. So that's good and sharing their experience. But, uh, do you have any experience or do you feel comfortable talking about lung nets a little bit? I do treat uh, well differentiated lung nets, so not small cell lung cancer, but I treat lung nets. Right. So can we talk about that a little bit? And also, I want to say those at home, we're, this is a current video that we're we're working on. My my travel for production for CCF obviously ceased. Uh, the last uh, bit I was doing was in February for the video series that we're releasing, and I am resuming soon and about to shoot the video on lung, lung nets and dip neck. But uh, so hopefully this is down the pipeline. It'll be a couple months, maybe, uh, or at least a few weeks, we'll have that available. But while we have Dr. Strasberg here, uh, Dr. Strasberg, you know, can we explain a little bit to those at home exactly, you know, what lung nets are? I know neuroendocrine tumors typically, you know, don't occur there, but we're seeing a lot of patients with that. What, what, what is unique about lung nets? How do we approach it? How is it different than your typical carcinoid or neuroendocrine tumor? Sorry. No um, yeah, the, I mean, I just want to make clear, uh, neuroendocrine tumors frequently start in the lung, so it's not rare. Um, they range from very unaggressive to extremely aggressive cancers. Um, but each uh, primary site for neuroendocrine tumors is unique. So you can't okay. say, how are lung nets different from GI nets? Because GI nets are not a 
homogeneous category either. Um, so let me ask you this. Nets, different from appendiceal nets, different from sure. pancreatic nets, different from... What, what are the unique challenges that a lung net presents for you? So advanced lung nets, which are also known as typical or atypical carcinoids, that's roughly the equivalent to lower and intermediate gastrointestinal uh, carcinoid or neuroendocrine tumor. But um, there's um, only one drug that's FDA approved for lung nets, which is Everlimus affinator. Um, somatostatin analogs uh, almost certainly work for lung nets that express somatostatin receptors. PRT, there's good evidence that it works when all tumors express somatostatin receptors, although lung nets are often more heterogeneous. So the same drugs work to some extent in lung nets, but uh, um, they, they're on average a little bit less studied, I suppose, than, um, than uh, nets of the gastrointestinal tract. And, and what about dipneck? What is dipneck? Yeah. So dipneck refers to diffuse idiopathic uh, neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia. So, so this is a condition where you get proliferation of neuroendocrine cells throughout the lungs, uh, which can form tumorlets or small tumors. Sometimes they can form actual large tumors, in other words, more than say five millimeters, but usually they're quite small. They're almost never malignant, um, but they cause long-term symptoms over many decades, particularly cough, and shortness of breath. So dipneck patients will have almost always a really severe cough that they've been struggling with that hasn't been explained very well. Uh, actually, just a few months ago, we published uh, the largest treatment study of dipneck where we reported that the majority of patients treated with somatostatin analogs had significant improvement in their cough, in their shortness of breath, and also in actual pulmonary function tests. So it really looks like the somatostatin analogs can can have a palliative effect in many cases, not not all cases. Um, yeah. Now, some dipnics, most dipnics are probably primary process, uh, but there are cases where we think it's a reactive uh, process that occurs in response to some other inflammatory lung condition. Is there any genetic component to lung nets? Well, <clears throat> genetic me is 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 non-specific question. If you're asking hereditary, um, okay. so you know, uh, meaning a mutation in the germline in the blood, um, you can get lung nets with uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia type one. Um, that's probably the one gen hereditary syndrome that results in lung nets. Otherwise, biologically, uh, you know, the standard uh, typical and atypical carcinoids are probably most similar biologically to pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors in terms of their mutational profile. Okay, thank you. How long does, uh, this is from Sherry, Sherry says, how long does PRRT continue to work after the fourth and final treatment? Well, the real question is how long until the tumors start growing again? And, you know, we can give averages, obviously, um, you know, every patient is different and depends to some extent on what line of treatment it is, what type of net it is, how aggressive it was before receiving PRRT. I mean, on average, a few years, if, you know, when we're to generalize. Um, although most, you know, a lot of the PRRT studies were done relatively early in the line of treatment. You know, if, if it's a it's kind of a, after multiple therapies, like any other treatment, it doesn't tend to work as well. Um, but on average, several years, everyone is, of course, quite different. Do you think there will ever be a treatment that would be considered a cure for nets or versus just, you know, as, as Rona or Rana says here, uh, and just keeping, keeping them at bay? So obviously uh, you can cure many patients who have non-metastatic disease with surgery. Right. Um, <clears throat> but for patients with advanced metastatic disease, uh, I would say that uh, cure uh, is, is probably not on the horizon, um, you know, in the near future, as is the case for almost any other cancer, especially, you know, any other so-called solid tumors. Um, there are, you know, there, there are some patients who can go into long-term remission with immunotherapy, although with neuroendocrine tumors, it seems to be especially rare. Uh, we're working on some novel immunotherapy approaches like CAR-T therapy targeting the somatostatin receptor, but, but that's nowhere near 
you know, human trials at this point. Um, you know, something like that, that targets tumors immunologically may result in longer term remissions than what, what we have available. Got it. And I mean, from the things that have developed, at least that I, that I know about the, the keeping at bay is, is, is getting better, you know, Absolutely. longer and, and, and quality of life is getting better. So um, I think we have a lot to look forward to. Margaret says, Rain, we love you. Oh my gosh, I got a compliment. Love you back. Uh, we've got just a few more minutes, five more minutes with, with Dr. Strasberg. So I'm going to churn through. How's the rest of your day looking, Dr. Strasberg? Uh, not too bad, thanks. Good, good, good. Let's see. That was an excellent differentiation between FDG and gallium PET scan. So that also means that you're you're, you're doing doing your job well. Um, carcinoid rage. Carcinoid rage. <laughs> is there any connection between nets and? Uh, I'm sorry. This is that's that's too much. I'm sorry. I'm gonna pivot on that one. My friend was just recently diagnosed while pregnant. She had her son at 34 weeks and the net tumors at the tail of her pancreas near her liver and then by her kidney. She's scared out of her mind and there and is not showing symptoms of cancer. Um, they told her they caught it super early, but she has one tumor that's 12 centimeters in size. Um, let's see. It's, it's possible. What are the testing besides the gallium 68 scan and all of her net testings should she have? She's scared of this illness, and I think a good part of that is because she witnessed what someone else had gone through. So, are you were you able to follow that? There's a lot of information. What other testing yeah, besides I mean, the? Um, this is, yeah, I, I think I think this is probably too specific. I mean, mm -hmm. I, this would this would be a case where we would want to look at the situation and and see what the next step should be. Got it. Um, Probably just time for a couple more, everybody. And so I will reiterate once again, if we didn't get to your question or you have more questions that have spawned from our answer or Dr. Strasberg to answer more, more accurately, uh, follow up with the Carson Cancer Foundation. We'll try to get, get that information to you. From Vicky, can metastatic abdominal net spread to lungs or are they two separate cancers? So, you know, cancers can spread almost anywhere, but... Uh, Gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumors have a strong predilection to uh, spread within the abdomen. So the liver, lymph nodes within the abdomen. Uh, bone would be probably the next most common. And, and bone, of course, can, can be in many different places. Um, spread to the lungs is relatively uncommon, certainly not unheard of. Got you. So we, we have a question about um, lanreotide. Uh, Susie had pancreatic net removed, then spread to liver, also removed, and now she's on lanreotide. What exactly does lanreotide do, and what are the long-term benefits? So actreotide and lanreotide are both somatostatin analogs. They're both very similar, uh, I would say almost interchangeable, um, but uh, uh, they, do two, they, they serve two purposes. For patients with hormonal syndromes, they help control hormonal syndromes. Most pancreatic nets, though, have no hormonal syndromes. And then, of course, they inhibit tumor growth. So there were two phase three studies, one with octreotide, sandostatin, the other with lanreotide, somatuline, uh, which showed a very significant inhibition of growth and time to progression compared to placebo. They don't actually shrink tumors, uh, but they can prevent them from growing on average for several years. Got it. I have a, a final question I want to ask. I always like to ask, ask guests. Um, many of the people, you know, why we have this program is because many of the people are, are, are early in this journey um, and, and, and scared. You know, they're not sure what to do. A lot of the people, a lot of the healthcare providers don't know, the, you know, don't have the information. Obviously, someone like you have that specialized in this disease. So if, if you were talking to a patient who was, you know, recently diagnosed, but they, they were in an area where they didn't have a specialist read, readily available or a net cancer center. Someone is basically just, you know, doesn't know what this rare disease is, how to approach it. What, you know, what are, what are the first steps that you advise to, to someone to, to give themselves, you know, the best shot to, to be their own best advocate and all that? What, where do they go when this happens? What, what, what is the, the, the first step you would advise them to take? 
Um, I think, uh, you know, as you point out, this is a relatively uncommon cancer, relatively complicated. Um, I think it's worth uh, being evaluated in a place where institution where people have experience with nets. You know, how to find that particular institution, that can be, that can be a tough one. You know, we don't have a, you know, a, a ranking, a U.S. World Report ranking of uh, neuroendocrine centers. Right. Um, I would say that most large academic centers will have someone who's has an expertise or interest in nets. Um, but um, I think it, I think it can be a struggle sometimes knowing where to go. And that's something also that that Carson and Cancer Foundation and other organizations will will try to help with. That's something that if you reach out to us, we can help direct you to at least the closest place. And as we talked about with telehealth uh, already, I know a lot of doctors are able to see people that aren't in their areas uh, geographically or in their markets uh, with you know, with what we're able to do now. Um, and I would just say from my experiences is, is try to learn as much as you can. We try to provide content so that you can do that. And the community is a great one. So so reach out, become a part of it, whether that's support groups or you know, um, finding communities like the one we've established here at Carson and Cancer Foundation. Everybody, that is our time for luncheon with the experts this week. Thank you so much. We had great, great numbers today. That makes me very excited. Uh, Dr. Strasberg, I really appreciate your time. It's been great work, working with you again. Um, for those joining us, thank you. As always, we reached all over the world today as, as we find, found out and we, and we usually do. And that's exciting too. If you have any questions, please reach out to Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, either here on their Facebook page or carcinoid.org. As always, thank you to our presenting sponsor, Lexicon Pharmaceuticals. We couldn't do this without you. Thanks to Dr. Strasberg. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks to you all at home. Stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. And join us next time next week for Luncheon with the Experts. Bye-bye, everybody.